Hazel. Um, I am the adults uh, educator at Mass Audubon for the Metro South region. So um, the Metro South region has four sanctuaries, the Stony Brook Sanctuary over here, Moose Hill and Sharon, um, the Museum of American Bird Art in Canton, and then the Blue Hill Trail Sides Museum. Um, in Milton, which is where my desk is, but I travel all around the region um, to do programs like this one. So I said that this was a grant funded program, but I also come and do other talks um, for groups as well, such as talks about owls, or this morning I did a talk on fall migration and all sorts of things. So you should definitely check us out if that's something you'd be interested in. Um, Mass Audubon is across the whole state. Um, quite a variety of things go on and what I'm trying to do here is combine Mass Audubon's scientific research section and bring it a little closer to the public so you guys can actually hear about some of the cool biology interesting facts um, that you might not otherwise hear from um, an education talk. So I have an undergraduate degree from the University of Rhode Island in wildlife biology and a master's degree from George Mason University in environmental science and policy, but I'm putting a cute little asterisk above that because what does that mean? That means I'm an ornithologist, I study birds. My thesis was on how urbanization affects the health of bird species in the Brazilian Amazon and in DC actually, because that's where I was for school. Um, so I study birds, but I also have a degree in wildlife biology, so I'm happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Um, and please feel free to ask them whenever, we don't have to wait till the end. Yes? Have you ever heard of drunken birds? Drunken birds. Right, we got them. They're eating the cherries and they're getting drunk and they're flying into my house. Well, that's actually a real thing that can happen. Um, certain like metabolisms, they can't metabolize as well because the enzymes in their stomach don't like metabolism fast enough. So yes, they can indeed get drunk. It's just like how koalas get kind of stoned from um, the eucalyptus leaves, yeah. Yeah, but there's only certain types of birds um, and it's very interesting. Uh, but yeah, so this is a talk, but also like feel free to ask questions or whatever throughout it. We don't have to wait till the end. Um, I forgot to switch the si slide. This is me. I also did wildlife rehab for several years. Um, so this is me doing that. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about all the wildlife that's just all around us. We're gonna talk about considerations for urban wildlife as in how come some species we see in urban areas and some species we don't. We're gonna talk a little bit about ID skills, um, which will be fun and maybe helpful if for anyone who joins us on the walk, um, just ways in which you can better your ID skills or if you like have a picture of something you really wanna figure out what it is, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we can talk about ways that you yourselves can all support um, wildlife around us. Now I think we often forget how much wildlife and different species are actually around us and how much they actually are influencing things like media, books, etc. I mean, we, I hope we all know Make Way for Ducklings. Um, I grew up um, an hour outside of Boston. Well, I technically grew up on the border of New Hampshire. Um, and I know this story very well. Everybody knows this story well. But I still feel like people forget that like, oh yeah, there's ducks in Boston. There's several ducks. There's many species of ducks and they live and they breed and they have babies and whatnot in Boston. They're right there. And then we even have books um, that specially talk about wildlife coming into people's homes and living in urban spaces. Um, if you give Moose, Moose a Muffin was another classic one I grew up with. This is a new one, Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. I actually don't know this one very well, but this is a new one. Um, and then Over the Hedge, the comic, the movie, all about um, wildlife living in urban spaces. And it's really, really common, even if we don't think about it that much. You know, common species that we might think about are things like pigeons, uh, raccoons, deer, and you know, mallards and ducks that we see um in the commons in boston so there is wildlife everywhere but some of it is more interesting maybe than others and some of it we might think of all the time and others that we might not actually notice around us for example logan airport is a big hot spot for snowy owls um, there's actually a whole program um, where people go to save the owls from the airport to bring them somewhere else because they'll hang out at the airport during the winter. Why? Because when it's snowy, it looks like a tundra. There's just wide open spaces, maybe with snow, like easy to stand on asphalt, and they will hang out there. Moose, this is in Marlboro, just down the road, this year, um, and they was just wandering between the houses, doing its, its daily thing. This is in Walpole, 
right, your neighbors, right down the road, a black bear. And then there's bald eagles all over the place in Massachusetts, mostly along the coast around rivers and shorelines. This one happens to be in Boston. It says Boston, and then I can't, I couldn't figure out what this word was. But they're, they're there, and there's 51 confirmed breeding pairs in Massachusetts alone of bald eagles. They're all over the place. Um, and they're in urban areas where you can see them. Um, there's also turtles. Um, this turtle was found up on the North Shore, um, brought to a wildlife rehabber because it was injured and then released again. So there is much, much wildlife in urban spaces that we don't even think of. So it's not just pigeons and raccoons, it's other interesting animals that maybe we don't see often, but they're still there. You just have to know where to look. Kind of tracking back a little bit, this is um, a map of the mean percentage of urban space in the world. It's also a couple years old, so this has actually grown a bit. Mm -hmm. But the red, red areas is high, high populations with the yellows being slightly lower. But you can see that the majority of the globe is covered in high population urban spaces. And we are in a very, very high um, urban space in America, a lot of urban spaces in the US. Um, and if we just get straight down to the United States and we zoom in on Boston, we're, we're with a bright red, so high population density in this area, which means high urban spaces, which means that more buildings are being put up and so on and so on and so on. So we're in an extremely high urban area. So you might think to yourself, okay, here's Boston, highly dense urban area. How many possible species could you see in Boston? Well, people have seen over 4,000 different types of species in Boston alone. Um, in this region that when I put in Boston in Google, it tells me this is correct. Um, I'm over in Somerville, also huge populations. And these are all sorts of different species, including um, 4,000 tree species observed over a thousand species of animals, including 250 bird species, 36 mammal species, and 26 amphibian and reptile species in Boston alone. I don't see 26 um, amphibians and reptiles on a daily basis, but they are here. You just have to kind of know where to look for them. Um, in Milton, where the Blue Hill Trailside Museum is alone too, all these points represent one thing. Um, there's over 16, thousand observations with over 2,000 species cataloged um, in just Milton alone. So there's huge amounts of, um, of wildlife in areas that maybe you're not thinking of. Um, the Commons is a huge spot. New, uh, Central Park, New York City, one of the greatest places to go birding in America. So they are there. They are in urban spaces. You just have to know when and where to find them. But what animals can live in cities and what animals can't? Well, it's a really, um, there's a very simple divide, though, as I like to say with ecology, nothing is black and white. Um, a lot of times I'll be like, you'll never see that bird in this kind of area, and then you see it. So nothing is completely black and white. There's always some overlap. But um, in general, we can divide species into what's called a specialist species or a generalist species. So for example, monarch butterflies only will feed on milkweed, um, then they'll feed on goldenrod, and they always migrate down to Mexico for the winter. They are very specialist. They can't suddenly switch to a different kind of plant to lay their eggs on. They're a highly specialized species. Raccoons can eat garbage, and they can live in the forest, up in the trees, and eat their nuts and acorns and other um, things, or they can live in the trash can in your backyard. So they are very adaptable to living in different environments. And it's these generalists, these broad adaptable species, um, that do a lot better in urban spaces because they can switch their lifestyle pretty much from very specific to more general and live in, in bigger areas. So there are raccoons that still do live deep in the forest. We're just not seeing them, because why would they? They're in the forest. We're gonna see the ones that have adapted to living in our backyard. The biggest generalist, I think, ever is uh, the pigeon or the rock dove, because these guys don't even really live in the natural habitats that they were before there were large cities. These guys, rock um, pigeons, rock doves, um, lived on the faces of like cliffs. Yeah, mostly in Africa, like big cliff faces. 
Um, and then they were like, you know what's better than that? High rises and Doritos. <laughs> so they said nah to the cliffs and they have highly, highly adapted to live in cities all over the world. So they can feed on a rich variety of things, um, mostly seeds, but they, they can eat, like I said, the chips, they can eat popcorn, they'll even eat a hamburger. Um, they're really highly adaptable and they pretty much live in every city in the world and they don't, there is still populations in quote unquote the wild, but not so much anymore. They just kind of left that area because a new opportunity presented itself. But certain species cannot do that. Another one that has been able to do this and adapt pretty well is the peregrine falcon. These are all pictures from Boston. Peregrine falcons are another um, species that liked cliffs, it liked tall trees, it liked deep, um, high spaces because these are the diving birds. These guys uh, can go 200 miles um, and like through the like this, you guys all get what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so they can dive up to 200 miles an hour, the fastest uh, known species on the planet. Uh, they live in Boston. <laughs> and they also figured out, hmm, you know what's a good snack? Pigeons. <laughs> so these guys, um, falcons, mostly feed on other types of birds. They like high areas, they like pigeons, juicy snack. So they're gonna move into these, um, urban spaces as well. And they're gonna build their nests on ledges of um, buildings, maybe even on, you know, like the gravel edges. In fact, I, I don't think it was peregrine falcons, but BU had a problem with um, a nesting pair of birds of prey um, that was nesting on the building and like frightening the students away. Um, it does happen. Um, I think it was a broadwing hawk, I can't remember. Um, but highly adaptable. These guys were able to <laughs> adapt to city life and make their way there. Another one is um, Eastern Cottontails, the little, cute little bunnies you see everywhere. These guys are even more interesting because they adapted very well to the suburbans. They can um, do like really isolated patches in the middle of nowhere, but they can also be in your backyard or in the common at Boston. They're, they're all over the place. And these are the Eastern Cottontails. Interestingly enough, we do have an, um, a Northern Cottontail that is endangered because the Eastern Cottontails have been so good at it, they've moved all the way up up the coast. Um, but again, highly adaptable species, can live almost anywhere. Foxes, you'll see foxes in cities as well. Um, they will come in and out of cities as much as the, that they will live in the middle of the forest, but they are able to adapt to cities. They'll get, you know, house cats. They'll also eat um, trash and they'll, they'll nest underground and oftentimes they're found under people's sheds, just like living under people's sheds um, or in bushes along a railway. They're like known to um, make their dens there too. I said nest because I'm an ornithologist, their dens there. I wanna talk a little bit about how cool this adaptability is. Um, and one of the best species to know about this when we're talking about urban species is a lizard that does not live here in Massachusetts. This is called an animal lizard. Um, and they are like the poster boys for urbanization um, evolution. But they're in the Caribbean. So we don't have them up here, but they have a really interesting adaptation that allowed them to transfer from living in the forests to living in the cities. And it all has to do with these little toe patches. This is kind of a complicated slide, but I, I will explain essentially what's going on here. And this image over here, this white one, this is the toe pads of the, for, the ones that lived in, live in the forest. Small, kind of round, straight down. But the ones that live in the city, same type of DNA, nothing's changed. The ones that live in the city have evolved to have longer toes, wider toes, and increased number of these ridges <coughs> on the toes to live in cities. Why, you may be asking. Well, this is a video of a forest, one of the lizards taken from the forest, um, and it has been put on a bunch of tiles at this angle, okay? So this is, we're looking like it, it's against like a wall and we're kind of looking at it 
sideways um, because these lizards can crawl straight up trees, like completely straight up trees just by clinging on. So this is that forest lizard um, on these tiles. So he's going up, he's kind of hesitating, kind of being awkward, walking kind of silly. Show that again real quick. Here he comes. So pauses. He, he seems like he's struggling a little bit, right? So this is the exact same species of lizard in this video, but this one has evolved from a couple of generations of ones who've lived in the city. And he has absolutely no problem going up. So very, just a quick little example of how simple things like they have bigger toe pads makes this lizard's life so much easier in the city. Um, if we take him and put him in the forest, he might struggle. But if we take the forest lizard and put him in the city, he struggled there. But they're the same exact species. Like there's no like genetic differences or anything along those lines. Um, they're just have adapted differently be based on their environment. A couple other species that have adapted really well are coyotes. That um, um, uh, metro picture is in Chicago. The L, the L train in Chicago. I think a couple of these, this one I think is up here. But coyotes, yeah, you can definitely see coyotes in cityscapes as well. Um, and then a couple like global um, animals that live in, live in cities around here. These are um, timber wolves um, in Denmark um, and Germany. Um, and these guys have been sighted near Paris in this picture. Um, and that one over there, that's a leopard in Mumbai. Look at him, he's just hanging like behind somebody's house, just right there. Um, this below picture um, is wild boars in um, Asia, in some of the big major cities, just walking along the path with them. And then these are um, smooth-coated otters in Singapore that are munching on all the stuff along the shore. Now, these guys are probably not gonna be seen as frequently in the cities. Why are they there? They're there because they've probably lost all their habitat mm -hmm. elsewhere. For example, the otters, uh, so many trees have been cut down around Singapore um, and around that space that they've had to look for food elsewhere so they're coming into the cities. They've lost mm -hmm. their space or something was built, you know, like a resort hotel on where their, their habitat used to be. So they have to come out and learn to survive um, regardless of the fact that maybe their homes have been destroyed. Uh, good news is, is Singapore has planted uh, two, mil um, no, two million trees in the last 45 years to try to um, support the wildlife. Um, but they're going into the cities. I'm sorry? Otters need trees? Yeah, these, these are smooth coated otters, so they're river otters. So trees in general along the shore are gonna um, support a larger ecosystem of fish who will come to eat the micro stuff off the roots. So um, mollusks will grow at the bottom of tree bases. It's just kind of like a big, it's like, it's called what's called a carbon sink. So there's lots of trees which improves soil quality, which in, uh, which um, helps riverbank quality, which helps whatever grows in the riverbank, which then the otters will come to. It's a big cycle. Um, but, <laughs> At the same time, there's a lot of struggle for these for species living in urban areas. And like I mentioned, we just talked about a whole bunch of generalist species. There's a whole bunch of species that are so specialized that they cannot, they just can't do it in the cities because of things like high pollution, um, light pollution, you know, tons of light pollution, um, traffic, dangers of living in a city, and then just um, forest fragmentation. What is that? That means that this patch of forest is not connected to this patch of forest. So the animal might be completely stuck in here and not able to get out because it just can't adapt to like moving across. Um, in fact, um, some animals can't handle sun, like they cannot, like they can't see well in the sun. A lot of birds in the Brazilian Amazon um, are very light, sen like photosensitive. So when stuff is cut down and they're separated like this, they just can't leave. And they're stuck with whatever resources are only there. I already briefly mentioned the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly, you may, you're probably going to see in urban spaces um, 
and even flying over Boston and things like that. But they're specialists in terms of like, there's not that much milkweed growing in the center of Boston. Um, there's not that much goldenrod directly in Boston. So they're probably gonna not go into Boston proper. They might be going around it. Musk turtles, these, are, these guys are threatened. This is a threatened species, super cool little guys. Um, but due to wetland and shoreline destruction and de degradation, um, they're highly affected by pollutants and water. So they just can't handle urban spaces because most of the water in urban spaces has at least some pollutant in it. Um, and there's just not enough spaces for them around here. So they just cannot survive in urban spaces. Other ones like the sawwit owl, there's not much for sawwit owls in the city. These guys feed on mice that live in the forest, especially like deer mice, not usually the ones that you have going into your house, voles um, and all sorts of things like shrews and stuff. And they are calving nesters, they nest inside trees. So it, it's unlikely that you're gonna see one as frequently as maybe you'll see a pigeon. Then again, this one was spotted in a tree right by um, Salem University, just kind of hanging out. Um, um, just, you know, sitting there and my boss has seen one at Fenway. So it's not like you can't see these specialists. It's just more like, it's very, very unlikely that you're going to see them. Um, and the reasons for that is because they just cannot deal with what other species have adapted to deal with. So where can you see wildlife in your neighborhood? Um, I've talked a little bit about how many species there are in the area, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there's a couple places not too far away that are major wildlife hotspots. And I say in the area, I mean like in relative space. The um, Ames Noel State Park is nearby and has like great birding. Um, Brockton, Mass has the WD Field, DW Field Park, also great to go and see in like a pretty, in a space that is surrounded by a lot. Um, Wamtucket State Park, also gorgeous, and you can see a lot around there. And these are like pretty relatively close driving, hopefully, if I got my map right, close driving to go see and to walk around and see what kind of wildlife you can spot there um, as well. Other options in Massachusetts are all the Mass Audubon Wildlife Sanctuaries um, are great places to walk around and look, look for wildlife. And this is just a map of all the sanctuaries um, and protected habitats that Mass, Aud Mass Audubon um, supports. Um, and you can go to any of these places to see them. And then even more um, directly in urban spaces, Mount Auburn Cemetery is again, one of the best places to go birding. They've seen great horned owls there that this is at Mount, Mount Auburn, right there. Uh, they see um, Baltimore Orioles, they get a lot of nests, Cambridge and Watertown also, you know, like they just have all these species right in the middle of a very big urban area stopping through. Like a great horned owl has no business being in Boston. What is it doing there? <laughs> but it was there and you can see them. You just have to know when and where to look, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about the end of this. If you get a chance to go down to the Cape, especially in winter, um, you can see all sorts of fun migrating ducks, ducks that have spent their summers up in Canada and are migrating here for the winter. Lots of really cool ducks you're gonna see. You're gonna see some shorebirds that you might not normally see down at the Cape. Um, but I bet when you guys go to the beach, you probably aren't really paying attention for those kind of things. And there's a lot of people. It's all just starting a matter of like, just thinking a little bit more, oh, what might I see here? Maybe if I go to where there's less people, I might see something. Maybe if I go at a weird time of year, who goes to the beach in the winter? I go to the beach in the winter because there's lots of cool things to see that you might not normally think about, um, but they are there. But the other thing I wanna talk about, especially um, if you are more of a, I like to look at my bird feeder, I don't wanna go searching, I just want to have the wildlife come to me, perfectly acceptable, I get it. Um, and I think a lot of people are like, well, it's boring just to watch the animals I see over and over again. It is not, because they're weird. For example, let's talk about pigeons again. Pigeons are one of the most intelligent animals <laughs> on earth, which is insane to me. But they are. I mean, these guys used to deliver letters. These guys can be trained to do all sorts of things. Um, they are intelligent and they can pass what's called a mirror test. So have you ever had a cat or a dog and you've put it in front of the mirror and go, look, it's you. And they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Pigeons get it. 
they have passed the mirror test. They are aware of self-recognition. So they recognize themselves in a mirror. Um, they can also recognize letters of the alphabet if they're like taught to do so and so on. So they can distinguish human faces, all sorts of things. Like pigeons are actually quite smart. Um, and they have incredible navigation abilities as well. So next time you see a pigeon, instead of just being like, ah, yes, a flying rat, um, be like, what is the flying rat doing? Because they do some really weird and cool things. They have some, they make all sorts of different noises. They kind of do little dances to communicate with each other and around each other. They might like get a little bit aggressive with each other. They might be bonding with each other. They might be talking to each other. They might be eating in different ways. There's all sorts of behavior that you can observe just in pigeons that you might not have thought about before because you're like, oh, there's a pigeon. I've seen so many of them. But if you keep watching and just trying to see like, what is it doing right now? It can actually be a whole new experience than just seeing a pigeon as you've seen it before. Did you have a question? Yeah, I'm just wondering how was it, how is it determined that they recognized letters? Um, off the top of my head, I don't know. I'd have to go back and read the study. Um, but, but they, but like they can recognize like patterns and shapes. So I'm pretty sure if, if, if I'm remembering the test correctly, it was like they would put a letter above like food and then one that's like above something else. And they figured out which letter meant what kind of along, along those lines, um, which many species can't or won't do. Um, but they can, they can memorize things like that. Um, and this is just kind of a quick example. Um, this is a bird feeder. Uh, I don't, I think up by Cornell. Yeah, this is, this is a bird feeder up by Cornell. And in this video, there are four different behaviors going on and I'm, it's, it's only like 30 seconds. So I'll play it a couple times, but there's four behaviors that happen in the span of this video, um, that you might not notice right away cause you're just like watching the birds. Um, I can turn the sound up, but it's not really important though. Okay. So in that video, four different kind of behaviors were going on. Not all at the same time, but they all happened. Those behaviors are foraging, number one, which is the simple act of foraging for food. Several of these birds fought, even if you didn't necessarily recognize it as fighting. There was, a, there was an altercation between two of them over here. Um, there was fleeing, which is the act of suddenly getting startled or scared and leaving. And there were several um, calls, not songs. They were talking and yelling and calling to each other and maybe even making an alarm call to be like, watch out for this guy. All that happened in the span of 30 seconds and I'll, I'll talk. Now we're gonna play it again and I'm just gonna talk. So everybody's foraging. The dove was scared off by the stardinal. Stardinal. The starling got rid of another one over here. More foraging behavior. The red-winged blackbird and the cardinal down at the bottom are okay right now, but now they're not because the starling landed and the red-winged blackbird was like, I don't have enough space, so this one has to go. Um, one just fled because it felt that there was too much going on. Many behaviors all seen in like, in 31 seconds in that video. Um, so imagine watching for five minutes, like what you can actually see these birds doing, interacting with each other. Just something to think about because I feel like often when I talk to groups like this, they're like, yeah, I know what a cardinal is. I know what a cardinal like does and how they're like, well, did you know that cardinals um, are cheaters? If you pay attention in the spring, you can see it. So in my backyard, um, we had a cardinal nest and it was um, Cleopatra and Caesar and their babies. But Cleopatra went and visited Mark Anthony quite frequently. <laughs> um, and you could see the interactions. So if you pay attention, even to those like normal, common backyard birds that you're like, I see them every day, you're going to see some really interesting things um, if you just watch them for a little bit. Yeah. One thing I noticed, I mean, since COVID, I've been doing, I've turned my chair around and watched outside the whole time. But um, chickadees and titmice only take one seed at a time and then fly off. Mm -hmm. and, um, the uh, goldfinches oh. just stay there and eat and eat and eat and make a mess because they leave all the leavings in the bottom of them. But yeah. it's really fun to see that. Um, yeah, because the chickadees and titmice are like, I'm not going to eat where I could be 
Attack. Attack. Yeah. And actually, fun behavior facts. So the goldfinches, you've probably seen a whole bunch of goldfinches there at once. They're all flocking together as a group, and they're protecting each other's backs. If one sees something, they're going to warn everybody else. Um, tufted titmouse, chickadees, downy woodpeckers, cardinals, um, white-breasted nuthatch actually do what's called a mixed um, flock foraging group. So the tufted titmouse and the cardinal, one goes to get the seed, the other one might be on lookout, and then there's one called a sentinel species that's just kind of like the titmouse are usually sentinel species and they're kind of like looking out for danger and if they see danger they're going to alert everybody in the area. So these guys are much more like the chickadees and the titmice might be like we're eating somewhere safe while the goldfinch are like all my buddies are around me I'm safe. So behaviors like that can be really just interesting to just like watch and check out. And um, you can also see like what birds are bullies like the red-winged blackbird bullied the cardinal but the blue jay is a big bully, so if, the, if we've maybe seen a blue jay land, we don't know who would have fled. There's all sorts of behaviors like that you can just observe, like at your own feeder, um, and check out, you know, what they're doing, because they're weird. Um, this is uh, not a bird, obviously. <laughs> this is a squirrel. But this is a fun little video. The crook may still be watching, but this is what he wants. In a shameless display of overacting, he pretends to bury his nut. So this guy's fake burying the nut. He's not actually doing it. He's just pretending. And this guy's watching him, he's spying on him. Wait until the performance is over. Then quietly sneaks in. But there's no nut to pull for here. Hardly surprising. It's stashed in his intended victim's mouth. <laughs> With the nut reader preoccupied, he can either eat it or bury it secretly. <laughs> but the thief hasn't abandoned her life of crime. Spy squirrel has a This is a fake up. robot squirrel that they made. The camera. And they can't and there's a nut inside. I mean there's a camera inside the nut. Theft is such an easy option. Around a fifth of all squirrels steal nuts rather than forage for them. <laughs> but this time, the thief has picked the wrong nut. <laughs> so animals are doing weird things um, that if you if you want to start like seeing those things just watch those those common oops computer's gonna die um, just start watching those common species that you see all the time every day that maybe aren't interesting to you anymore but start kind of thinking about it through these lenses like why is that bird doing that? Is it doing it to be mean? Is it doing it to get something? What's the benefit of that behavior? Um, and you might find some really interesting things. A couple things though on if you do want to expand your um, abilities to ID more animals or find animals that maybe um, you're interested in seeing but you've never seen before. Um, couple fun apps for that actually. These ones are, are a bird or wildlife specific. If you're really interested in birds and you want to like get better at bird ID, the Merlin um, bird ID app is incredibly helpful. It walks you through how to identify a bird. It also has this fun new thing that says get sound ID, which I wish I'd had in undergrad, um, where you just press the button and you hold up your phone and it listens to all the birds in the area and it tells you what birds are singing. It's magical. Um, not perfect, but it works really, really quite well. Um, iNaturalist, I'm actually gonna um, pull up the website for I iNaturalist in a minute and just show you guys kind of how it works in case you're curious. Um, and then there's an app called Seek by iNaturalist. This one's also really cool. Um, it uses your phone's camera, so if you're like, what kind of plant is this? And I'll use it when we're on the walk for people who are interested. Um, I'll take a picture of that type of plant and it will um, ID the plant for me. Again, not perfect, but pretty cool. It will get you pretty close. And then you can post it online um, and people can try to help you 
figure out what kind of planet it is. So it's easier than ever to ID um, different species um, that you that you might be interested in discovering. Um, talking a little bit about what like what you can do personally um, to help support wildlife and urban spaces. Um, the first thing is providing food sources and you can provide different types of food sources to attract different types of animals. <coughs> For example, this Baltimore Oriole really loves um, jellies and oranges. So my mom has the, and there's like fancy feeders for exactly this purpose um, that might attract um, Orioles to your yard because they're frugivores and they like fruit. Um, native flowers can attract all sorts of those monarch butterflies we talked about, hummingbirds, all sorts of species are attracted to native flowers. Um, so if you focus on having native flowers, maybe instead of ornamental flowers, you could attract all sorts of things, in, including native grasses, native sage grasses can attract all sorts of native species as well. Um, and things like butterfly bush that attract pollinators and so on. And then you can do um, other things like building a bat box um, to attract bats. If you're interested in that, I know a lot of people are not interested in attracting bats, um, but you can build bat boxes to, to try to get maybe some bats roosting, which you should if you hate mosquitoes. Um, but I also understand some people might not like bats. And then there's other ways um, to see and protect animals um, that are very simple. First of all, if um, you can find a vernal pool in the springtime. Vernal pools are wet areas that are dry for um, the winter and a good chunk of the year, but when it rains, heavy, heavy rains, um, these fill up and kind of form like these, these little ponds um, in the forested areas and frogs and salamanders will come to these and what hunts frogs, owls, so you could see owls at these spots or other um, animals. Sometimes you can even see wood ducks and other types of ducks at vernal pools. So if you know a spot for a vernal pool or like thinking about finding one next time you're on a walk and you're like, oh, this looks like what I think a vernal pool is, maybe I should come back here in the spring. Leaving your leaf litter can be really beneficial to lots of wildlife. Um, you know, as much as you can, um, that you don't need to rake up Luna moths lay their eggs underneath the leaf litter and those eggs stay there all year and then they hatch in the spring. Um, so leaving your leaf litter supports like things like moths, things like that. Also turtles will hibernate, what it's called brumating in turtles, underneath leaf litter and logs and things like that. So actually leaving your leaf litter can be really helpful. Composting also amazingly helpful, attracts worms, what worm, what eats worms, birds, and all sorts of things like that, so composting. And then um, I already talked a little bit about um, putting feeders up. This is just a different type of feeder to support winter birds um, during the winter, especially. I'm sorry, I know like the podium's in the way. Um, and then of course, if you're just curious about seeing like maybe what lives around you or um, you can use trail cams. They're quite expensive, however, um, if you have one, that's awesome, but there's also a whole bunch of places online that you can type in like uh, animal webcams um, and you can watch those. The Cornell has a whole bunch for birds um, that you can watch um, and, and just watch those from the safety of your comfy warm house. You can like watch what animals um, have been going by. Things that you can avoid, uh, don't feed the wildlife. Um, it might, like from your hand, obviously I just said bird feeders are okay, um, because it can make um, species too codependent on people and while bird feeders are fine, they're still foraging that food themselves. Mm -hmm. They're not being handed it from your hand and it, can, and it can cause some codependency problems with birds being like, ah, yes, the hand that feeds me. Um, you can try your best to avoid pesticides. Pesticides hurt the insects. The insects are eaten by the birds. The birds give the insects to their babies can be problematic, um, and also for other species as well that are eating whatever plants you're spraying with pesticides. And then if you have outdoor cats, you can give them a fun, cl fun clown collar, <laughs> like this one. These work, my mother uses them. Uh, best thing you can do if you let your cat out is just to put a bell on it, because then the, you know, whatever it's catching can hopefully hear it. But even better than that, you put these ridiculous clown collars, which make, look how cute he looks in it, um, which is highly visible so that um, animals can see um, you know, this highly visible creature. Um, and it actually makes it so the cat's like, when it's preparing, it's like, what is this fabric? And it gets confused. So it doesn't hurt the cat and it can help protect dogs too. Things like that keep, keep them inside when there's wildlife outside. And that is it for the lecture portion. 
but we have quite a bit of time left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in my computer that's about to die and I'm going to go on to the iNaturalist website and show you what kind of things are in your area and how you can use that to to identify stuff. And also, if you have any questions about any wildlife, you know, birds, mammals, reptiles, I'm happy to try to answer that. Um, but thank you for sitting patiently through the lecture portion of this thank of this talk. You. Thank you guys. This is called Project Feeder Watch, and if you're really interested in getting to know the birds around you that come in the winter, this is a great um, uh, program to do just to get into it. And Mass Audubon is um, doing a Project Feeder Watch. So what is that? That is you're just watching the birds and recording the birds that come to your feeder and logging them um, with the Cornell lab so that the lab can get like a good kind of estimate of how many birds are being seen and where different birds are being seen. We're doing this at Moose Hill um, on Friday and Saturday mornings. It runs from November through April. So if you ever just wanna to come to Moose Hill, sit inside, look out the windows at the bird feeders, um, we are going to be doing that. Um, we have not yet posted it to our website, but that's just a fun, simple thing to do. And it also, you can do it from your home. You can sign up for your own account um, and do it from your own feeder as well. But I skipped over this part um, during the the lecture because I oops because I um, wanted to. Um, <laughs> but this is yes. Um, the the past couple of years, there's been a thing that you shouldn't be putting out bird feeders because of a yes. virus. Yes, the avian flu was going around, and here is my recommendation about the avian flu. Um, yes, it is out in the wild, just like any flu. Yes, it hurts birds um, and can be detrimental to them. However, um, it's really mostly common right now, only being seen along the coast in coastal birds. And as long as you're cleaning your bird feeder regularly-ish, like you don't have to do it daily or every time you fill up the feeder, um, keeping that clean, you're, you're just providing for the birds. It's, it's not going to harm them. I mean, when we're being honest about diseases and stuff like that in birds, there's so many different kinds that they get from each other, just like with people, right? Um, so you might be taking feeders down to protect from avian flu, but previously there was also still avian flu and there's also mites and there was also West Nile virus in birds all over the place. It's just naturally occurring. So I say you can definitely put your feeders up, um, maybe bleach them every month um, or just keep them clean, but you can definitely put your feeders up, but in general, just good hygiene wise, you should clean them. Yes. Um, one of the things that I recall reading was that um, it was more that because they're um, congregating at the feed, yes, that absolutely. they're more apt to give it to one another. Yeah, yeah, because through saliva and things like that. Um, I mean, yes, you're, you're not wrong, but again, um, we're looking at lower rates. Okay. Um, we are looking at they're going to do that anyway in the middle of a forest when they find a patch of something. Mm -hmm. Like these birds flock together anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like I, I can't say none of them are gonna get sick by coming to the feeder and hanging out with the other birds, but also they can be getting sick, you know. Um, so I would say currently, I don't see a major problem. A couple of years ago, the one that happened in 2020 when they really told you to take your feeders down was actually something completely different and we still don't know what it was. I was working in a wildlife rehab at the time and that was very different. Like. It was, it was very different. Avian flu and things like that are not like new. They've been here, they've been around. Um, if you have chickens, then I would say don't do it because you don't want one of the birds giving it to your chickens. That would be my only suggestion. It's gonna live amongst the wild birds as any disease will live amongst the wild birds. But if you have pet birds, maybe don't put them out if you feel like you wanna be extra safe. Gosh, um do hummingbirds really eat the fruit flies on bananas? I just saw a banana feeder for a, for a hummingbird. And it said that you just put the banana in and it develops fruit fries and the hummingbirds will eat the I fruit flies. I suppose I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard of it. But they are, like they do, they they they're protein. nectivores. Yeah. They, they, they drink the nectar and get yeah. the sugar from that. So. Do they need protein? Um. 
not quite in the same way that that we're thinking protein okay. there's just different like stomach system and enzymes yeah. so like i would not at all be surprised if they're eating little little bugs too but definitely not them they're not insectivores in the way of like that's their main diet um a i don't know what banana one i haven't heard of that one yeah i've um, never heard of these. yes when i see a little red squirrel about that big mm -hmm. and then its tail about that big is that a baby gray squirrel or is that no, a, red? It's a red squirrel really mm -hmm. they do they are there are, red, are squirrels. red squirrels yes mm -hmm. and but i never are... see an adult red squirrel so that probably is an adult red squirrel and they're, and they're meaner too. And they're, they're right, and they're meaner. Faster. So they're just different. They're just a different size. They're not the same size as gray squirrels. When we were on vacation, they dug, they ate through our garage door. A red squirrel. Yeah. Because we saw it, too. and he yeah. ate through the plastic uh, tub that we had of bird food, and oh. got the bird food. Oh, and no. then when he went out, he made a new hole. To go out. Good for him. <laughs> oh, I, like, I think it's just a size difference. I don't think they're babies. You're not going to see baby baby squirrels because they stay naked and ugly until they're basically almost adults and ready to come out. Um, <laughs> but I don't see red squirrels too frequently. Um, but yes, I guess the answer is I saw yes. One <laughs> it was bright red. I was yeah. surprised. Yeah. Um, any other questions? About anything, yeah. So somebody told us yesterday there was an albatross that lived 71 years. Oh, that yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I wouldn't doubt that. She said it was true, but I mean, I don't. I I would need to fact check. Yeah. But albatross are very long lived. Yeah. I mean, that does seem like incredibly old. Yeah. But like she said, she was true. But we were coming here, so they we are to ask. the coolest birds. Albatross. I've seen them in New Zealand. Um, they actually have basically a locking joint. So their joint is locked open when they're when they're soaring because they can soar for days at a time without landing. Yeah. And so their their arm is actually locked in an open position and they're just gliding hmm. with the with the wind. Crazy yeah. birds, insane. Absolutely bananas. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, are you do you have a question? Well, no. Uh yes. I saw a hawk, and I think it, somebody said it was a Cooper's hawk. Is that common? And absolutely. It's on the cape. I don't know why I'm doing this. Another of my favorite websites. Sometimes I, I should be sponsored by Cornell. Um, um, this is another. This is my. This is a great birding website resource. So we have um, hawks. Um, several different. Several different species of hawks. Um, Cooper's hawks look like this. Um, and they look very, very similar to another hawk that we also have here called a sharp shinned. Um, so incredibly similar. Yeah. I struggle to tell them apart unless they're sitting right next to each other. Um, but yes, we definitely have those here in Massachusetts. So the speckled breast is not juvenile like it is in a lot of birds? Um, nope, they just have one, yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of hawks actually. I think most people are like, we have red tails. And I'm like, haha, we have so many more than that. But yeah, the red tail is probably the one you're going to see the most. Yeah. All right, I'm just going to flip to this is iNaturalist. This is just the front page of what iNaturalist looks like. This is the website. It is linked up with that Seek app, the photo one I just talked about. Um, and this is citizen science data. So it's anybody is logging things that they see. Um, onto this website, so biologists, um, literally anyone, um, can go create an account and log information. Every red dot is a point that something has been observed, um, and clearly there have been a lot of observations. But let's just, and I don't know why it wouldn't work earlier. Um, it didn't, like, it. it I don't, this is not just Norfolk, it's selecting it's like, county. it's the whole county, and I don't know how to like set it to not select the county. Maybe the zip code. Oh, what's the zip, what's the whip? So, five, six. Oh, two, oh, five, six. Yep. Look at that. <laughs> okay. So there's been about 4,000 observations um, in Norfolk, and there's been about um, 1,000 species. So let's say you want to go birding in your town and you're like, where should I go birding? And you don't know about Stony Brook. Um, and you really want to do birding. Now this is all species, this is plants, this is all sorts of things. But you can go here to filter, pick bird. And then I'm going to look at the list view. And then it gives you a list 
of birds people have logged. Most of these are pretty common, but let's say you're just really in the mood to go see a mute swan. Well, there was one on October 8th um, on North Street somewhere that you could go see. You know, there's been an osprey was seen in August. So they have the dates of when they were logged and so on. So, you know, you can look specifically in your town. You can also with this, and I like to tell people about this because I think a lot of people are like, I wanna go see things, but I have no idea where to go. Um, this can be a pretty handy resource. Google's also great in general. But let's say you really want to see, I don't know, what, what animal do you guys, what do you wanna see? Anybody River have? River otter. River otter? I'm gonna do North American river otter and I'm gonna set it for Massachusetts. And I'm gonna turn off the fact that it's a bird. <laughs> and here we go. River otter observations wow. in Massachusetts. Um, if we want to look, what was that zip code? 025656. And there has been one observation at the Stony Brook Mass Audubon Sanctuary. Wow. Um, somebody logged it. I don't actually think it's in this picture. Is it? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it is. There it is. It's like back here. Oh. Um, it was observed probably by someone who either volunteers or works there on June, in June, it was observed there. So if you're like, I want to see a river otter, you could go to Stony Brook and maybe see one. No guarantees. It's probably not going to be the exact same spot, but at least you know that they have been observed there. So something, some just a resource to use, especially when we live in these more, you know, urban areas to be like, huh, where have things been seen? Like right here, for example, I don't know what this is. This is um, a wildlife management area. And they've clearly, there's been several spotted over there. So if you're like, I really want to go see them, I probably would go there, you know, because there's been several like spottings of them over here. So just another resource that you can use. Um, when you're trying to find wildlife in urban spaces. Yes. We have wild turkeys in our yard. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure you do. Oh, yeah. sure. Oh, yeah. I didn't know they could yeah. fly so high. Oh, they're, they're weird birds. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of turkeys in Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, now, as we can see in this map, there's a lot more. It seems to be around Boston. Why? Two reasons. There's more people over here vlogging. Two, there's a lot more like um, rural space in Western Mass. So they just might not be as seen as frequently because yeah, there's in, the yeah. in, trees. in trees. Do they have their babies in the trees? No. Oh. But turkeys will roost up in the trees, and then if you ever startle turkeys roosting up in the trees, they will fall to the ground. <laughs> um, they will put their wings up. They're not good flyers. I mean, they're basketballs with wings, so they're not very good flyers. But they do, yeah, they'll roost up in the trees. What kind of area? Where do they put their baby? Their Probably over there. Mm -hmm. They hide the nest somewhere? Yeah, somewhere in the, in the forest. Yeah, they're just out there doing turkey things. I have to be honest, I don't know too much about turkeys, which is kind of bizarre. But yeah, they um, they form big groups, um, raise their young, nest in forested areas. Yes? I have in my backyard, which has a stream, I'm right near the Franklin Country Club, mm -hmm. and it started off with nine, right across my yard. Yeah. Then two, two three weeks later, mm -hmm. four. Mm -hmm. Now Gosh. we're down to two. Because yeah, um, you know, there's fox and, and coyotes around. The yeah. big birds fly up in the trees, but the little guys are probably left on the ground. They yeah, can't fly. That's I mean, so if we're talking in terms of um, biology evolution, that's why they have so many to begin with. Yeah, exactly. So, for example, owls only have maybe five eggs, but usually like two, um, and they might only raise one of those young. It's much smaller. But they're also cavity nesters. They're in trees. Those babies are protected. It's much easier to defend a hole in a tree than it is to defend, you know, the forest. Um, so um, it's, kind of, it's called R selection versus K selection, which is a whole, whole big thing. But basically, um, you know, like mice and small birds, they'll have like a lot of babies and just try to see how many survive to adulthood because it's a lot harder um, when, you're, when you're small like that. Anything else? I think it's about time.
to be done and go on our walk? Yes. What was the, you had mentioned, you know, the I naturalist. Is it seek or seeker? It's seek, S-E-E-K, but here's the kicker. When you go onto the App Store, I highly recommend you type in by iNaturalist because it's not the first one that pops up. It looks like this. Mm -hmm. um, seek by iNaturalist. Um, very cool. Anything else? I did, I'm one. Yeah. Just with the Orioles, I did Oriole stuff. I saw, during COVID, I saw an, a, a couple of Orioles, and so I put out an Oriole feeder, and I was just walking down my driveway, and I thought I saw an orange thing fly. And he, he built a nest right in the tree next, I mean, and I found it, which is like. Was it weed, crazy? Yeah, like weed, yep. a yeah. big hanging yeah. thing, right? Yeah. We have a seasonal stream, but it was, I never saw the babies, but he, he and she were both there the whole, yeah. whole summer. Yeah, it was Probably. fun. Probably, yeah. You might not see the babies because the babies, by the time they, they, they fledge, which means they have feathers, they're not like fully beautiful adults, mm -hmm. but they look a lot like just the female version yeah. of birds. Um, so if you don't know what you're looking for, it can be really hard okay. to, to see actually, because fun fact, a lot of the male, male like for example, goldfinches, they are like become a very dull yellow brown yeah. in the winter. They're, they don't retain that beautiful yellow color because it takes a lot more energy to be colorful. Oh. So in the winter, they're just fattening up and trying to survive. And then in the sum, in the spring, when they're like, okay, gotta track the ladies, they'll put more energy into color and there's more food so they can spare to do that. Not a conscious thing, obviously, but like that's, that's essentially what's happening. Yeah. All right, well, um, I'm done for the talk, but- Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Were thank